Hi guys, Dane here, and today we're in for one hell of a video. So this is my uh, top 40 books and worst 5 books of 2018. I'm going to share some stats with you as well. Now I haven't even looked at these, so bear with me, and I'm going to have a little look. Alright, well we can have a look at my 2018 reading challenge. So my goal was 200 books, and I read 283 books. Yes, I read a lot of books. I think I come second only to uh, Mara from books like Whoa. Okay, how do I see more specific statistics? I don't know. All right, so 2018, yeah, 283 books. Uh, it's my best reading year since 2016 when I read 391, but that's actually not accurate because some of those include reviews of books that I'd previously read as well. So it's probably my best reading year since joining Goodreads. Probably because of Booktube, I don't know. I've clicked the details on this and it's just taking forever to load. Bear with me. All it's telling me is that the longest book that I read was The Passage by Justin Cronin. Which actually I don't think it was because I'm sure my copy of The Talisman was longer than 766 pages. Is that it? Is this all it's going to tell me? Alright, so it looks as though the lowest overall rated book that I read was Food by Gertrude Stein, which has an average rating of 1.93. I gave it three stars, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think all the people who didn't like it, didn't like it because they don't know who Gertrude Stein is. So they were like, oh, I don't get what this book is supposed to be, and it's like, well, you, that's just what Gertrude Stein is like, mate. And the top rated book that I read, it's actually a tie between two Latvian books, which are Latvia, 100 Snapshot Stories, and The Life of I. Now, uh, I got both of these for free. Actually, I rated them both 4 out of 5, and the average rating is 4.67. So I guess three people in total rated them, and the other two gave it 5 out of 5 stars. Uh, after that, we have Please Hear What I'm Not Saying, which was edited by uh, Isabel Kenyon, which is a poetry collection in aid of a charity called Mind, a mental health charity, so perhaps that's also not surprising. And then that's followed by The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas on 4.55. So, uh, yeah, all right. Well, there's that. I think that's it. I think that's all I can gather from these statistics. So we're just going to jump straight in to my top 40, and then I'll do my five worst at the end. So, now obviously I don't want to talk too much about each of these books because we'll be here forever, so I'll probably give you a brief overview, and I'm not even going to give you star ratings, I'll just introduce the book and tell you what it's about. So in at number 40, we've just mentioned it, it is Please Hear What I'm Not Saying by Isabel Kenyon. This is a poetry collection in aid of mind, a mental health charity, all of the poems about various forms of mental health. My poet friend Katie Lewington also has a poem in this, and uh, yeah, this was uh, Kenyon's first publication from, uh, I can't even remember what the, pre what the publisher is called now I don't know I can't remember what the publisher is called but what's cool is that you can name the sections yourself and they also kind of get less and less bleak so they start with the bleakest poems and then get less bleak as, as time goes on in at number 39 talking about Latvia as well this is Nora Extena Soviet milk translated from the Latvian it was uh, published originally there as mother's milk all set during the Soviet era and it's kind of about this dysfunctional relationship between a mother and her daughter uh, I did a full review of both of these. In fact, I'm just assume there's probably a review of these books because if I enjoyed them, I probably did do a review and I'll list all of the ones that I can find in the description below. Yeah. In at number 38, Fortunately the Milk by Neil Gaiman and Chris Riddell. This is basically a children's book that uh, Riddell illustrated, Gaiman wrote. And what I like about this is the illustrations of the dad who is quite clearly autobiographical because he looks exactly like Neil Gaiman. I'm trying to find a decent photo of it. Uh, not photo, a decent drawing. I mean, you get the picture, so to speak. Yeah, enjoyable, adorable for kids. Would recommend. One of the Gaiman books that I like because I, I find it to be hit and miss sometimes. In at number 36, we have Fame by Andy Warhol. This is one of the Penguin Mini Moderns and this is basically a collection of Warhol's aphorisms on fame, love, relationships, beauty, all that kind of stuff. I will read one out to you at random. If you're naturally pale, you should put on a lot of blush on to compensate. But if you've got a big nose, just play it up. And if you have a pimple, put on the pimple cream in a way that will make it really stand out. There, I use pimple cream. There's a difference. 
Probably not the best one to give to you from that one, but trust me, it is uh, an enjoyable read. In at number 35, we have Calm by Tim Parks. So basically, Tim Parks was uh, suffering from some illnesses and he ended up going on like a yoga retreat. He was a big skeptic of it, as am I. He actually ended up going on two of them and these kind of recount his experiences. He actually, you know, he, he gave it his best and I think uh, he ended up, you know, taking on meditation and yoga and whatnot just within his personal life. Uh, you know, just to help to, to help him af after the uh, retreats and whatnot. So there must have been something in it for him. I wouldn't necessarily want to read the full book that this was excerpted from, but I think for the length it was just right. And, um, you know, it's something that I've been trying to think about more myself. In at number 34, we have The Talisman by Stephen King and Peter Straub. Now, despite the fact that this is at number 34, I didn't particularly like it much for a King book. It was all right, though. I actually read it while on holiday in Berlin. And so perhaps that's part of the reason why I also kind of have nice memories of it as well. And uh, how many pages is this? 766, seven, well the page numbers come off it there, but I'm sure that's longer than the talisman, I don't know. Anyway, uh, yeah, it was, it's alright. I also read Black House, which is the sequel to this, and thought it wasn't very good at all. This one was alright, it's been compared to Lord of the Rings, it's kind of like a portal fantasy almost. In at number 33 we have... Jim will paint it electric dreams. So basically Jim will paint it is an internet celebrity and he creates all of this artwork and paint. So here is, uh, for example, uh, Steven Seagal, Jeremy Kyle and Slipknot on an 18 to 30 holiday in Western Supermare. And people write in and request these things and then he, he makes them in paint. Here is Brian Blessed punching a polar bear. And uh, you know, he's just a talented guy, very humorous collection, I enjoyed it. And he's got a new book coming out with Unbound soon as well, which is cool. At number 32, we have The Red Tree by Sean Tan. And now this is basically a mixture between a graphic novel and a poetry collection. Uh, well, not it's really, just a long form poem. I will read you some of it. I keep reading from the start in my videos. So uh, let's go from here. Sometimes you just don't know what you were supposed to do or who you are meant to be. Or where you are. And the day seems to end the way it began. But suddenly there it is, right in front of you, bright and vivid, quietly waiting. Just as you imagined it would be. So it's just beautiful. Really enjoy it. I'm going to stop doing the numbers now. I guess I'll put them up on the screen in the bottom left corner so that I can tell what number we're on. Or that you can tell while we're, while we're watching because I've already lost count. Up next we have Javier Marias, Madame de Defond and the Idiots, and this is basically five sort of short stories, almost essays I guess you'd call them, about famous writers, literary critics, that kind of thing. So in here we have Madame de Defond and the Idiots, Nabokov in Raptures, Juna Barnes in Silence, Oscar Wilde after Prison, and Emily Bronte the Silent Major. It's just a good bookish book, and if you're into books about books, you'll be into this. Then we have Daphne de Maurier, Rebecca. I have some issues with this particular copy because the introductory essay just spoiled the entire thing. So does this as well, that gives away the ending. <laughs> so, uh, and, and then the introductory essay was by Sally Bowman who was basically just trying to sell her like Rebecca's story, which is like a retelling or whatever. I hate, I hate retellings and this is one of the reasons why. However, if you are able to go into this totally blind, I think you'd enjoy it more than I did after having it spoiled right as I was about to read it. But it was still pretty good, and uh, I liked Demaria's writing style, the way she built tension, all that kind of stuff. All right, then we have And the Ass Saw the Angel by Nick Cave, and this is as in Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. And uh, this was recommended to me by my friend Amy. She said it was one of her favorite books, and I happened to have it. So I was like, right, I'd better read it then. And I wasn't disappointed. It's kind of almost post-apocalyptic, like pseudo-religious fiction. I don't know take that with a pinch of salt because it also reminded me of like the Dark Tower books by Stephen King so it's just it's just a very strange book and I like very strange books all right up next oh shift along Dane up next we have The Blind Watchmaker by Richard Dawkins this was actually one of my bedside books just because it's quite uh, an intense read it's also quite old now I think it was published about when I was born there are even some references to like software now available on Mac 92 yeah, you can get it on Apple Macintosh, RM Nimbus, and IBM compatible computers. Yeah, the, the appendix is 1991. This is basically debunking the fallacy that evolution 
needs a god, you know? So the idea of a blind watchmaker, a lot of people say, well, the human eye is so perfect, you can't have half an eye, therefore it was designed. And uh, he kind of compares that to a clock and being like people say we well, can't have a watch without a watchmaker and the idea of a blind watchmaker is that that's what evolution is it's blind because there's no sentience guiding it it's you know it's just the process over time is what causes these things to develop and he even talks about eyes like even the ability to tell light from dark would give you a significant evolutionary advantage and so eyes didn't just spring up overnight it was gradual evolution over time you know would recommend and we have Agatha Christie and Autobiography. You may remember at some point last year when I read this. This was a buddy read with Mara at Books Like Woe. And uh, I ended up doing a 45 minute long review of this because there was so much to talk about. I wouldn't necessarily recommend this if you're not a Christie fan. But if you are a Christie fan, you're going to love it. Even though it doesn't necessarily talk so much about her writing. It's more about her life. Um, but then she kind of says and this is quite sad she always saw herself more as like a housewife first and a novelist second despite being i think the best-selling author of all time you know but um yeah definitely read this if you're if you're into agatha christie and i believe brian's bookshelves will be reading this soon as well as part of his agatha christie a to z okay then we have race by tony morrison so this is one of the vintage mini moderns i read this just before christmas on a train home it's definitely a challenging book it contains excerpts from some of her different work and it does really make you think about race what i liked is that she shows white people being racist but she shows black people being racist as well she just shows everybody being racist and i think that's kind of important i think we all have inherent biases whether we like to admit it or not you know so uh, i think books like this are important to make us make us confront that and this acted as a really nice introduction to her work and her writing style i uh, really enjoyed it despite the fact that it was bloody tough going and uh, yeah i look forward to reading some more of her stuff okay next we have in cold blood by truman capote this was another one of my bedtime reads but don't let the fact that i read it as a bedtime book fool you like I do that with books where I, I only want to read like 20 30 pages a day as opposed to normally I read like a hundred but it was just because it was slow going especially for the first hundred pages but then it really picked up and um, yeah I really enjoyed it in the end I thought it was really insightful the way that it kind of dealt with uh, the crime but also the personalities of both the victims and then the uh, the perpetrators as well so if you're into two, true crime definitely check this out it's like the the first founding book in the genre then we have Dragons at Crumbling Castle. This is a short story collection by Terry Pratchett. It's kind of middle grade. He actually wrote most of this when he was a teenager. He was writing for the Books Free Press, which is our local newspaper here in High Wycombe. And uh, yeah, it was all kind of written during the 60s. So you have this kind of Middle England vibe still going, but there's also lots of fantasy. You get King Arthur, you obviously got your dragons. There are even one or two bits in here where uh, he, he writes about the carpet people, which would eventually go on to become his first novel, although I don't think it was ever published until later in his career. But all in all, fascinating, and it just made me kind of sad as well, though, because I love Terry Pratchett, and, you know, I've all read almost everything he's ever published now, and it just makes me sad each time I read a new one, knowing that I'm one book closer to the end, you know? Speaking of Pratchett, we have Where's My Cow by Terry Pratchett. So this is like... It's hard to explain. Basically, in the Discworld books, Sam Vimes reads a book called Where's My Cow to young Sam Vimes. And then this book is kind of the story of Sam Vimes reading that book. Except Vimes gets a bit bored with reading Where's My Cow, so he turns it into an Ankh Morpork version. So we have little lines like... Uh... He tried it the very next night. It went, Where's my daddy? Is that my daddy? It goes, Bugger it. Millennium Hand and Shrimp. It is foul or Ron. That's not my daddy. So that probably won't make much sense to you if you've not read the Discworld books, but uh, for me, it was it was it was it was a blast. Next up, we have one plus one equals three by Dave Trott. This is a masterclass in creative thinking, or you could call it thinking outside the box. And basically, Trott writes in these in this very odd style. Next up, we have Midworld by Alan Dean Foster. This was recommended by Todd the Librarian. It's one of his favorite books and it lives up to the hype. It's kind of a weird mixture of like fantasy and sci-fi, but it also has like a moral to it as well. In ways, it almost feels like a YA novel, but not as well, but better. <laughs> uh, yeah, just 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 check this one out. And uh, Alan Dean Foster as well is now writing all the Star Wars novelizations. So you know he's a good writer, you know? Hello, this is where The Haunting of Hill House goes, but um, yeah, I, I can't be bothered to go and get the book. And yes, I keep missing books on this list for some reason, but we're getting there now. Yeah, 
This is uh, The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson. Good book, review down below. Hooray, let's keep going with the video. Almost finished editing, oh my god. Here we have Martin Luther King, a letter from Birmingham Jail. This is literally, well, it's two pieces. It's a letter he wrote after being arrested. And so he wrote it from Birmingham Jail. And then the second is like a, a speech that he delivered at a church, basically. Both of them super thought provoking. And I particularly like, in the letter from Birmingham Jail, he explains why he was like proud to be arrested, basically. He stood up for what he believed in and got arrested for it. And he's like, I would do it again. Definitely, uh, th that was the first book in the Penguin Mini Moderns as well, and it was a great start to the series. So probably check that one out potentially before you check out any of the others to see if you know, see if you enjoy it. Let me have Angie Thomas, The Hate You Give. This was actually also a buddy read with Todd the Librarian and with Beth Chat's books and possibly some others. I don't need to go on too much about The Hate You Give. Everybody knows what it's about. Haven't seen the movie. Don't really care to be honest, but the book was good. It was one of the few booktube books that genuinely lived up to the hype for me and i just think i think uh give it 10 20 years that's going to be taught in schools you know yeah, then we have language by zhao lo guo and basically this is written by a chinese woman who moved to the uk i think she actually moved from communist china and obviously everything was very different to her she'd never been in the west before she ended up falling in love with an englishman as well but what's interesting is that it's all written in kind of the vernacular with which she spoke as well so uh, for example I won't go immediately my room, think about Englishman who smile and kiss me like lover, but I see Chinese landlord sitting on kitchen, watching TV and waiting for me. He is yawning. He worried my late back. At the same time, wife come down from upstairs bedroom and sleeping room. We were so worried about you. We never come back as late as you do. Nervous voice remind me of my mother. My mother always talked to me like that. I just thought it was really insightful and it kind of gives me, you know, a way, for example, right at the beginning she arrives at Heathrow Airport, I think, and it's just interesting to see from somebody who's never seen really seen the western world before what those first impressions were like and i think as a white british dude i think that's kind of important and also i just think i can imagine it being the other way around if i flew to beijing i'd be so confused <laughs> i think we can also agree that my chinese would not be as good as her english Okay, next up we have Girl with a Pearl Earring by Tracy Chevalier. This was, uh, I got this because Hannah Tay here on Booktube has an Etsy store and one of the things on there was like a uh, mystery book, Hannah's favourite book or something like that. So I bought it. Here's what arrived. It was excellent. It was very, very good. Uh, historical fiction based on uh, the Johan Vermeer painting. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was worried actually that it was going to be a romance, but it wasn't. And that, I think, is why I liked it. Because it wasn't, I think, I think she could have she could have done that as an author, and it would have just ruined the book. And so I'm so glad she didn't. And uh, yeah, we'll totally recommend it, especially if historical fiction isn't normally your thing. Okay, then we have Andy Weir, The Martian. I read this with a bunch of booktubers as well. Can't remember who. I think Mindy's book journey was one. Brian's bookshelves was another, and some others as well. Again, everyone knows about The Martian. This is a bit of a booktube darling. It does live up to the hype. It is very funny. The science isn't too over the top, although I like sci-fi anyway, so I don't think that was ever going to be a problem. And I particularly like that he basically lived on a vegan diet while he was on Mars because he just ate potatoes. Okay, then we have R. Doris by Charles Heathcote. He is another booktuber. Uh, this is probably one of the best indie books that I've read this year. Well, we'll see what else is on the list. This is about a cantankerous old woman called Doris and her husband, Harold. It's a very British sense of humour. It reminds me of keeping up appearances and uh, that kind of stuff. And it does translate well internationally, though, from what I've seen from other booktubers. And so if you are tempted, I definitely would suggest this. And if you watch Charlie and you enjoy a sense of humour, this book is very Charlie, you know? You know when you read a book and you, you, just, you can tell that the authors put a lot of themselves into it? That book there. Here we have Isaac Asimov, Earth is Room Enough. This is a collection of short stories. My favourite in this was actually Dreaming is a Private Thing, which inspired an album called Dreamies by a guy called Bill Holtz. Sort of psychedelic music, first known use of sampling in popular music, really. He actually spent like two years recording it and cut up tapes and sellotape them together and stuff. The concept of that story is that dreams are created by professional dreamers and then they're commercially on sale, so you can go out and buy the dream that you want. But all of the stories in this are just fascinating. Asimov is great. Yes, yes, yes. I should point out at this point, actually, I'm not including uh, rereads in my top 40 because that'd be weird. And you might also notice this is basically an amalgamation, amalgamation of my top 10 of each quarter, but then ranked in overall order. Uh, also, I should also disclaimer at this point, you know, if you look at my star ratings of these, they might be slightly 
off or whatever, like they might not correspond exactly with this list. That's because star ratings are approximate, and I only use them because Goodreads makes me. Next up we have The Perks of Being a Wallflower by Stephen Chbosky. I read this in one go on the flight home from Latvia. It's about a young lad called Charlie, and um, he's a wallflower, basically. And it kind of goes through his home life, his school life, and all just the, just the struggles of growing up as a, a teenager, really. It's like YA, but hard-hitting YA. I think it's been banned a few times because of like references to abortions and drug use and all this stuff. I actually didn't think much of the movie, but I thought the book was excellent. And again, I, I devoured it in one go on a flight. Then we have The Rats by James Herbert. So this was given to me by my mum. She actually got it from her work in like a used book exchange thing. And the reason I wanted to read this one is because when I was younger, I had a hamster at my dad's house and the hamster escaped. And my dad was watching Deadly Eyes, which is the movie adaptation of this. And just as they were getting to one of the scenes in the sewers, he turned around and the hamster was just sitting on the sofa behind him, just staring at him and it scared the crap out of him because the hamster used to escape all the time. This is uh, just, it's just true horror, really. Not true as in happened, but like true as in true to the genre. Uh, very gory, very bloody. Just the right length, perfect pacing. Uh, the first James Herbert book that I've read, but I'm sure it won't be the last. And I believe it's part of a trilogy as well. So, Okay, then we have Charles Heathcote again, Indisputably Doris. So this is book two in the Doris series. The other one was book one. Book two was actually my favourite. So in book one... Our Doris is trying to win uh, like a garden safari where like everybody in the street or whatever they all open up their gardens and some judges come along. In this one she's trying to get elected to the position of chairwoman as the Women's Institute but uh, she has to fight off some stiff competition let's just say that. And we also get to meet more of the extended family in this. Uh, Harold, sorry I almost pronounced the H there. Alright and my battery died so where was I? Oh yes I was talking about Harold. Uh, he's more cantankerous than ever in this I think arguably and it just it just grew perfectly from the first book while also it could still be read as a standalone as well and I think it takes it takes a certain level of I don't want to say genius because Charlie's big-headed enough joking Charlie it's fine but um you know it takes some planning I think and some some you know quality writing to be able to write a series where they build on from each other in each book, but they they can also be read as standalones. It's actually what I'm trying to do with the Lightfall books at the moment. All right, then we have Haruki Murakami. What I talk about when I talk about running. So this is kind of a combination of a running memoir and a writing memoir. Murakami is in his 60s now, I believe, but he, he's run a marathon every year for like 25 odd years. And basically, he was about my age now when he started being a writer. And before then, he'd managed a pub. And so... He decided to quit uh, running the pub and to become a writer and he realised instead of getting all this physical exercise and whatnot, he was spending all of his time sitting down behind his desk. He was smoking 40 a day and so he used that as his kind of excuse to take up exercise, also to quit smoking. He figured if he's going to be the best writer he can possibly be, he needs to increase his longevity as much as possible. And just there was a lot of philosophy in this that I've tried to take and apply to my own life. Alright, then we have Albert Camus. <laughs> I don't know why I always say it like that. I always find it funny to do that for some reason. Uh, Albert Camus. And uh, this is Create Dangerously. And uh, I'll read the blurb for this actually. Camus argues passionately that the artist has a responsibility to challenge, provoke and speak up for those who cannot in this powerful speech accompanied here by two others. And just that philosophy of creativity and art being something that should challenge things I think is something that we can all learn from. Especially, I mean, as booktubers... We're all creators. If you're a writer, you're a creator. Even if you're knitting or you're cooking or you do, you know, art or anything like that. If you make music, you are a creator. And Cami basically argues that it's our responsibility to to speak out about things that are wrong in the world. Okay, then we have Essie Hinton, The Outsiders. I read this, I think, way back in January after uh, Catalyst Reads basically recommended it to me. Fun fact, I also created a Wikipedia page for The Outsiders House Museum for a client because uh, the, the house where the movie was filmed has been turned into a museum and has all this stuff. And uh, yeah, just an amazing book. And uh, Essie Hinton was only 17 when she wrote this as well. And I think because of that, she's managed to capture youth brilliantly, but also the character arts in this, uh, the, the development that they go through as well, and just the way that it shows intercity rivalries and all that kind of stuff. Now, I have ran out of space. This video is going to be the fucking death of me. I have no idea where we got up to, so I'm just going to go on to the next book, which is Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck. I believe this was another buddy read with Catalyst Reads, actually. Another one from right at the start of the year. My first exposure to Steinbeck. And what a powerful story this is. 
I, I just I recommend this to everyone. I think it's actually on the curriculum in the US. It's not taught necessarily over here in the UK. So if you're British, check out uh, Of Mice and Men. And then I do want to read more of Steinbeck's stuff. I haven't got around to it yet just because life's been hectic. But um, yeah, Of Mice and Men. Lenny. Oh, poor Lenny. Actually, was that a spoiler? That wasn't a spoiler. We have Work by Joseph Heller. So this is selected from the book Something Happened. I haven't read Catch-22 yet, but I want to, but I'll probably read Something Happened first just because I love this so much. It's basically all set inside an office, and it's all kind of about this, you know, the kind of uh, inter-office rivalries and office politics and stuff like that and all the bitching that goes on. If you've ever worked in an office, you'll find a lot to relate to in this. And it's kind of sad but funny at the same time. It's a very odd mix and uh, would recommend, and I'll definitely be reading Something Happened. Then we have Shaking Hands with Death by Terry Pratchett. So I'm going to read the blurb of this because this gives you the specifics of what this is. So, uh, when Terry Pratchett was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in his 50s, he was angry. Not with death, but with the disease that would take him there. And with the suffering disease can cause when we are not allowed to put an end to it. In this essay, broadcast to millions as the BBC Richard Dimbleby Lecture 2010, he argues for our right to choose, our right to a good life and a good death too. So basically he was a passionate supporter of euthanasia. It never actually came to that in his case. But, um... You know, it was just very moving to read this, especially knowing that he has sort of passed away since. And again, he's one of my favourite authors. I, I, I didn't cry during this, but my eyes got a bit damp. And uh, I just think everybody should read this, really. But particularly if you've got an interest in elderly care, dementia, Alzheimer's, that kind of stuff. We have As You Wish by Carrie Elwes with uh, Joe Layden as well. So this is Inconceivable Tales from the Making of the Princess Bride. I hear the audiobook of this is really good as well. As soon as I knew this was a book, I knew I had to check it out because I love The Princess Bride. It's one of my favourite movies. I've also read the book. I actually prefer the movie, but probably just because I was raised on it, you know. And uh, yeah, it was just really well written, just full of little insights into the cast, in particular into uh, Andre the Giant, who sadly passed away in like 1994 or something. Hey, Google! When did Andre the Giant die? Andre the Giant died on the 27th of January 1993. That was close. Would you like to hear more? No, thank you. Uh, so yeah, if you're a Princess Bride fan, definitely check this out. I don't know whether it would make any sense, really, if you haven't at least seen the movie like a couple times or something like that. But uh, as memoirs go, and particularly celebrity memoirs, can't fault it. And also, Carrie Elwes is going to be in the next season of Stranger Things. So there. Okay, then we have Heart Shaped Box by Joe Hill. This is basically about an aging rock star called Judas Coyne. He buys a ghost on eBay to go with his collection of weird paranormal stuff. And the ghost turns out to be real. And it's just haunting and very unsettling. Again, similar things to uh, The Haunting of Hill House in terms of just how creepy and unsettling it was. Except there is also like true horror in this as well. And uh, Joe Hill is actually Stephen King's son as well. You can kind of tell in his writing. But if King himself had published this, I would have probably put it up there in his top 30% of books, something like that. Crack and read, definitely recommend it, especially if you're into horror, and I will be reading more Joe Hill soon. Then we have Stephen King on writing, so this is a memoir of the craft, it's basically a combination between King's own memoir of his own life and his advice uh, on writing. Now, a lot of the stuff in this is less relevant, I would say, it arguably will not be relevant at all within five to ten years, I would say, uh, in terms of stuff about finding a literary agent and, uh, you know, submitting to magazines and stuff like that. Basically, what you need to do now if you want to get a book deal is to uh, have a successful YouTube channel. Yeah, I mean, times have changed and they've changed a lot since this book was written, but still, a lot of the advice on actually writing itself is still spot on. A lot of the stuff... Uh, is really interesting in terms of King and how he wrote his own books. So he talks about, you know, particularly things like Carrie. So that was uh, the manuscript for that was uh, salvaged from the bin by his wife, Tabitha King. And just all the different stories about how his books came about and were published. This is a must for any King fan, but also for any serious writer. Which brings me to my book of the year. And I think a lot of you probably already know this because this was an early contender and it just hasn't been unseated. And that is The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. This just blew my mind, basically. I think um, just the fact that everything in it is kind of has historical precedent. So nothing that she writes about hasn't happened elsewhere. I know Murphy Napier didn't particularly like this, and neither did, I think, Lou G, who's one of my viewers, and uh, the May Cave as well, Megan. They didn't particularly like it either when they read it. But for me, this was just... This changed my worldview. And also, bearing in mind I'm quite a big Orwell fan, this is now my favourite piece of, you know dystopian literature. I just think it was really well written, very well conceived, 
And I think a lot of the complaints people have are to do with things like you don't get to see, you only get to see things through Offred's eyes, which I think actually made it more powerful. The only thing I didn't like about this was the little essay at the end, uh, historical notes on The Handmaid's Tale, because what that did was it took the ambiguity of the actual ending and made it less ambiguous. And I thought it was perfect the way it was without that little essay. I, I don't think that essay should never have been written. I just don't think it should be published with a book. I think it would work well as an aside, or even if there was something like one of the Penguin Mini Moderns where they have excerpts from the book and then you could include it like that. I just, reading it straight after the book, kind of, it diluted it somewhat for me, but still, just an amazing book and I definitely recommend reading it. Which brings me to my five worst books. Hello, Dane from the future here again. Just to clarify something, while I've listed these as my worst books, I don't know if that's actually what they are, because the, basically the criteria I use for this is the five that I would least want to reread, if that makes sense. So I'm sure that I've read, uh, I read something by uh, Shug Hanlon called Exploration, for example, which is like, it's just a, a kind of a punkish dude had made a, a, like a zine, which I didn't particularly like, and that objectively I would probably have to put as one of my worst ones but also it was only sort of 40 pages long so I'd happily reread it so the ones on this list are where I guess it's a combination of I didn't like the books and also they were too long for me I don't know not the books I don't know what I'm talking about I just felt the need to insert some sort of arbitrary disclaimer here because I'm scared about people kicking off about the books I've chosen but that is by the by these are my opinions you don't have to share them all right let's go now this is where the dislikes start pouring in I'm gonna try and be brief with these because I actually don't want to criticize them too much because then people start having a go at me and I don't want people to have a go at me just because I didn't like a book so, we'll just run down these through these quickly and I'll just give you maybe one or two sentences on why I didn't like them. So, at number five, we have The Passage by Justin Cronin. It's too long, it's poorly edited. This could have been a third of the size and the entire trilogy could have probably fit in one book this length. Heard comparisons to The Stand. It is nothing like The Stand apart from they're both post-apocalyptic, but I'll tell you which one I would rather read. The Stand is one of my favourite Stephen King books and obviously this is one of my least favourite books of the year. In at number four, we have uh, Luis de Bernier, Captain Corelli's Mandolin. Now, this was another one that was recommended to me by Amy, and because she'd recommended Nick Cave's book, I was like, oh, she might be onto something here. So I read it. It wasn't bad. It just wasn't my kind of book. Like, I think, actually, I don't know. I think the passage was pretty bad, and a few of these other ones were pretty bad. But this one, I, I can appreciate why some people would like it. I, I think if you like Life of Pi, for example, you'd like this, because nothing happens, basically. It's, um, it's kind of a character study, but I, I just didn't care too much. And also, it's set during the Second World War, but you don't really get that. And number three, we have The Book Thief by Marcus Zusak. Again, I think part of the problem with this was that it was set during the war, and I just didn't think it did a very good job of it. It felt very YA to me. I don't know whether it was supposed to be very YA. Uh, that wasn't the impression I've been given by people reviewing it and whatnot, but I suppose it makes sense. And I just didn't like... You know, it's narrated by death and whatnot. Felt like a gimmick all the way through, and Death kept sharing spoilers as well, which was infuriating. It made me not want to read the rest of it. This is another one of those books where I thought the movie was better than the film. Don't hate me. Number two, The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Safon. Again, this just read like YA to me. There were some very troubling things as well, like when the main character was watching somebody sleep. And just like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I... So everyone corrected me because in my review I said I thought it was YA, and they were like, no, it's literary fiction. I'm like, is it? I wouldn't have got that from it. I mean, yeah, there are like sentences in it which are well written, but I thought the story itself was a good idea, badly executed. The characters were fundamentally unlikable and it, it just dragged on for way too long. Sorry. And at number one, we have a book that I literally set fire to the corner of in one of my reviews. There's a little bit of charring there. Obviously, I didn't burn the whole thing because I'm not a heathen, but uh, this is Stephen Fry, The Ode Less Travelled. And my problem with this is it's meant to be like about unlocking the poet within and it's meant to be a good introduction to writing poetry and this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, he doesn't like free verse basically, which is what I write. And he was very condescending about it. It was also very smarmy. Even like the index, he just has some twatty lines in it. So we go from Kigo in the uh, appendix or the uh, glossary of terms to Tomato. 
A red savoury fruit sometimes known as a love apple, which has a place in many sauces and salads, but none whatsoever in a glossary of poetical terms, especially when it has not been inserted in the correct alphabetical order. I don't know whether that's supposed to be funny, but for me it was just irritating, especially as were all the jibes throughout against free verse poets. Because again, it just felt to me like, well that's really off-putting, you're saying that that's not a form of poetry, basically, is what he's getting at. And I just... I think to dismiss an entire school of poetry because you don't like it in, in a book that's meant to be about introducing poetry to people it's just a dick move and it just it was also very boring he shares some of his own poetry in it which was very bad as well oh just don't even get me started on this book just don't read it so we have finished oh that took ages Thank you if you've watched this far, at least you've watched the edited version, and uh, yeah, it was a good year for reading, apart from those five books, and uh, yeah, bring on 2019, sorry this is late, but as you can imagine, this took quite a long time to find all the books, to film, to edit, to share, etc, etc, but uh, yeah, here's to another year of booktube, so as always, thanks a lot for watching, let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books, and if so, what you thought of them, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video, thanks a lot, Bye bye